Hey there, this is Will with the Real Estate Examiner. Today I wanted to talk to you about the MMA uh, mini model approach to appraising and development. Uh, one of the most important things that I can talk about in this is that when you use numerous models in your appraisal development, you consider more perspectives and more market reactions, which is our responsibility as appraisers. We need to consider more market reactions so that we, we can measure all of the market reactions and create a good aggregate and report that. One single model, one single analysis for let's say market conditions is not necessarily quality analysis. We need to consider different segmentations of the market data and identifying the neighborhood as well as other factors of value that may skew those market conditions uh, inappropriately in our analysis. For instance, if you had a most recent sale that was 20 or 30 percent above the average, six month average, let's say, uh, one of the most significant factors of value in my area is condition. Uh, if that condition of that property is far f more superior uh, than the comparables that in, were in that last six months, uh, that comparable should be either removed or weighted less in your market conditions uh, analysis. And that's just one example. There's numerous, and there's numerous ways to handle that in a many model approach. So we'll get into that later on in the web series, uh, but I just wanted to kind of bring that up. Uh, that's one example. Human beings have shortcomings in our cognitive abilities. We are not the processors that a computer is. Uh, we are very good at a lot of other things, but we typically have biases worked into our analysis that we're unaware of. Um, cognitive dissonance or confirmation bias or um, recent uh, occurrences tend to wait tend to influence our analysis more. Uh, so we tend to ignore base rates. Uh, we assign probabilities uh, reg with regards to reasonableness, uh, not actually just probability. Uh, and we may, uh, so models share three characteristics. They, one, simplify data. They remove unnecessary details in a large domain, and they go ahead and they will provide you logic with less detail. Uh, two, models use mathematics and therefore create precision in the analysis. Uh, they remove ambiguity in the data and that brings to the third characteristic, all models are inherently wrong. When you remove from reality details, then your model no, no longer is a mirror of reality, right? Obviously. And when you remove those details and you create a precise perspective, what you've done is you've removed data from your data set, which is the refinement that we need as appraisers to develop opinions and conclusions. But with that in mind, logic comes at a cost. We remove information from our data. So when that happens, when you use just one model in your analysis, have you considered what your perspective is on the data? How much data you've removed using that perspective? Or have you not refined your data enough to create that precision in your mathematical analysis? Those are three humongous takeaways for the MMA approach that I would like you to consider. All right, so let's go through a few examples of the model characteristics that I just went through. Uh, one being model, models simplify reality. Uh, two, models use mathematics to formalize and make more precise the data set. And three, models are all inherently wrong. They aren't 
a perfect mirror of reality. And that's really important when we consider the types of models that we use and how many we use. Uh, so let's pull up a data set here and look at that. Uh, here is a whole hood neighborhood of a property that I was praising at one point in time. And it's it's a large data set. I pulled it specifically for this class. Um, there's 2,300 properties in this data set. So you can see that there's a lot of information, right? So I want to show you some uh, linear regressions, not not for the purpose of showing you the the model and the you know the the linear fit or per se, but actually just the data set, the scatter plot. So you see the dots on here on the scatter plot. The lower axis is square footage, and the uh, y axis is the uh, close price. So independent variable, dependent variable, right? And you can see at the upper end, there's much less homes uh, being built over 6,000 square feet. So you have less data on this upper end of the data set, uh, typically because most homeowners don't want properties over 6,000 square feet or 8,000 square feet. They're too expensive. Um, and you can see the data and how it's divided up here and, and, and how it's separated. And that's really important. It's what I want you to take note is that this is the whole neighborhood. There is no refinement in this data. Uh, so when you look at this, can you, can you get information from this? Can you say that square footage has a linear relationship with uh, the closed price of a home? Inherently, you may want to assume that it does because uh, it's residential real estate and most often times there is. Um, but with lot size, you can look and, and you, it's not quite as clear. Uh, you have a very large range of uh, sales that have uh, over four, you know, there's, there's one over here that has over 400,000 square foot lot size. You're not getting a lot of information from this. And that's important to identify in your data set, especially when you're looking at the MMA approach. Uh, so you have many more homes that are significantly smaller with lot sizes, and this data needs refinement. Uh, here's the pending date information. You can see a, a slow incline there among the large data set. It's kind of difficult to see though. Um, and here's the actual coefficient value for that. So that'd be $259.91 per day growth. Uh, for the whole hood data set um, for the for the close date uh, and year built you can see that there is quite a few properties that are actually built after the year 2000 so you don't necessarily have a data set that's going to be used well for your subject property uh, you have to consider things like is your subject property built before the year 1990 or is it built after 1990 and it's actually closer to the 2020 range. You can see that some properties over here uh, do sell in the higher range because they are possibly newer or there's a co-correlation of factors. The newer homes could actually be uh, built after 2010, could also be these same properties that have over 8,000 square feet uh, in gross living area. That's important to identify in your models is co-correlations. Um, so those, that's something we'll get into in, in later in the web series. Uh, whole counts of bathrooms, uh, number of garages. You, you can only get so much information because your data set is not refined. So let's go ahead and let's look at a refinement of this data set, uh, particular to after identifying the uh, market segment for the subject property, uh, which is a market segmentation analysis. And we'll get that uh, in a later. Okay, so we've gone through the whole hood data set. Uh, we've gotten some information from that, or we think we have, we've created some hypotheses maybe, but now we are we need to go ahead and we need to refine that data set. Uh, so what I've done is I've created a, a smaller segment of that of 1,400 to 2,200 square foot homes. Uh, and then. I ran my regressions on that, and now I'm, I'm getting more information now from that data set. Uh, 
uh, in my regressions. You can see that there is many, many fewer uh, data points in that uh, in this analysis now, and I can actually look at how many came out. We had 2,300. Now I have 142. Uh, so that's you know that's a much smaller, and and that's what you need to do. You need to refine that data so that you can get information from your data set. Uh, as you saw before, there's a lot of things that we weren't able to get. We weren't able to identify whether a, a, a factor of value, square footage, lot size, uh, pending date, close date, uh, year built, beds, baths, garage count. We don't. We couldn't tell if a factor of value was linear and had a direct relationship uh, with close price. And that's what we're trying to identify. We're trying to identify those market reactions. Um, now we're getting closer to being able to identify those for each factor uh, that we're considering in our analysis. Uh, square footage here, you can see 1,400 to 2,200 square foot range. Uh, we have a data set that is fairly equal on both sides. There are some outliers here. Uh, when I say equal, equal in distance to the uh, linear line here. Uh, with a coefficient of about $80 per square foot, that would be an adjustment if you were to use this, but this is just one model. We don't know if this is the best model to use. Um, this is our lot size. Now, initially, you could, you look at this and you say, I need to refine this, don't I? Not every property here is comparable to the subject property if the subject had, let's say, an 8,000 square foot lot size. Uh, why would we ever compare that to a 75,000 square foot or larger lot size? We wouldn't. Um, so we need to refine this data further, especially in regards to lot size. So we'll end up doing that later. And here's the pending date information. You can see that there is certainly growth in between July 2020 to uh, January 2022. And close date, pending date, uh, year built. You can see that there is more information to get here in year built uh, from 2000 to about 2015. Is there a direct relationship? Is there an increase uh, with the year built? So as homes uh, have less age, are they worth more? Uh, another way to say that is as the year built increases from 2000 to the year 2015, do homes increase in value? That's not easily determinable in this analysis, in this model. Uh, there is some suggestion that there is not an increase in value um, because these properties over here that have, have occurred in about 2003 or so are similarly, similarly uh, valued over here. And we need to consider that in our analysis. Um, is this a significant factor of value? If there was a linear regression plot that had properties that were going straight up or to, at a 45 degree angle upwards like this on a linear regression line, and were, it was easily determinable that the age of a property was a strong influence on the close price. See, that's the type of examples it's, you need to be able to compare these models to other models. That's why the MMA approach, the many model approach is so important. Um, let's look at the other factors of value. Uh, bedrooms. So this is one of those properties. This is one of those factors of value that uh, are have a strong co-correlation. They, they correlate with square footage. As a property increases in square footage, so does bedrooms generally. Um, so when you have this property and with this factor of value here, you got to really determine on whether you should consider this bedrooms factor of value in your final analysis. Is there a direct relationship uh, between bedroom maximum maximum number of bedrooms and the close price? of a property. Uh, so it's, it, it's important. 
and we'll get into that in later on in the web series, but I just want to show you uh, this relative to the three characteristics of models. Uh, bathrooms, full account, uh, so full bathrooms. Uh, you can see there isn't much information to gain from that. Most full counts are of ba full baths are, are two baths. There is a three there, just one though. And then there's garages here. Uh, there isn't a lot of information to get. You have one data point here, one data point here, and two data points here, and then the rest of them are two garage. I, I can't gleam any information from this because there isn't a number, a greater number of zero car garages, one car garages, and three car garages. Your data needs to have a similar density along your regression. Otherwise, the quality of your data model goes down. I'll say that again because it's very important. The density of your scatter plot in your analysis. If it is not similar along your regressions, similar along your plot, then your quality of your data set, the quality of that model gets poorer. It's worse, all right? And you need to consider that. You can see here that the density around this linear regression is pretty good. It's a little bit, there's some more data plots over here possibly. Uh, and there's a concentration here as well. But it, relative to this one, or especially this one, uh, this is a pretty weak model, isn't it? So some things that we could do to further refine this data set is going ahead and removing this sale this zero car garage and this one car garage and this three car garage, especially if the subject property is a two car garage. Uh, in addition, if the subject property has an 8,000 square foot lot, we need to tailor our data set for the subject property analysis. We don't need this uh, nearly 100,000 square foot lot sale, do we? So again, I want to go over the three characteristics of models and how that relates to what we just did. We had a whole hood data set. It had a lot of information and we couldn't get a lot of information. It had a lot of data to it, but it, we couldn't get a lot of information from it, right? There's a lot of issues with the models that we'll get into, uh, but we did start getting into a little bit and we couldn't get a lot of info from it. Then we refined the data set, just as we did in characteristic number one, models simplify reality. They strip away some information and unnecessary details to allow for communication of what is important. We capture logic and information in our data set by refining it. If you don't refine your data, you're not getting everything you can out of it, generally. Model two, or model characteristic two, models use mathematics and therefore formalize and make precise the ambiguous and less defined. This is all mathematics. We're creating a linear regression line based on the fit of the data set, and we're able to visually identify with our eyes that a, a computer cannot do well uh, the shape of the data set around the linear regression. We're able to identify the density and any groupings of the data set, and we're be able to identify any outliers and be able to remove those outliers and gain even more information, which we'll do in a later class. Uh, finally, number three, all models are wrong and inherent in that logic comes at a cost. By creating a model that simplifies by removing unnecessary data and creating precision, by defining information, they omit details. Therefore, it is important to create multiple models to reduce that narrowing of detail and perspective in our analysis. This is exactly what happens in the marketplace, although perhaps with less logic at times, but each buyer and seller of real estate create models to develop opinions of price. 
what they are willing to sell and purchase real property for. This is important to us as we also create models of their interactions, just like this. This is exactly what an appraiser needs to do. This is exactly the type of measurement that appraisers need to be do need to be doing. We should not be doing this in our heads. This should be able to be formalized and developed with algorithms. And we go ahead and we be we are able to do things that that computers cannot do. AVMs cannot do this. Absolutely not. We are significantly better at it just because we are able to identify things and scatter plots that they cannot. Uh, so I, I hope that you've gotten something from this. If you'd like, send me some feedback. Tell me what I could be doing better. If you have questions on this very abstract topic, this very important topic, uh, please let me know. Easily, the most important thing that you can learn in this MMA web series is those three characteristics, and that one model is not good enough. Thanks for watching.